you've never felt better than when you've purposefully felt in a cool hand knit, but you've never felt worse when it was accidental. Fiber Junkies, welcome back to The Color Cauldron. I'm Johanna, the owner and dyer behind Potion Yarns and host of this podcast. We are going to be talking about a super fun topic today, felting your hand knits. I want this to be a fairly quick, easy intro video, so we're not going to spend a ton of time, but I quickly wanted to go over what is felting, how do you do it, how do you avoid it, and show you a project I'm working on. So the first thing is what is felting? We've probably all had a bad story about a wool sweater that we purchased, or we've heard a story of someone else, or maybe one that we hand knit that went in the washing machine and or the dryer and suddenly came out going from an adult size man sweater to a teddy bear size sweater, right? It's happened to the best of us and it stinks when it's not intentional. This is not gonna be a video about that. However, some of the tips telling you how to get your hand knits to felt, if you do the opposite, you should be okay. If you want more information on this too, you can check out my previous videos on bleeding yarns, crocking yarns, or color releasing that I did a couple months ago Although we are talking about how to avoid getting your color to bleed out of your yarns when you wash them, there are a lot of really good tips about washing and treating your hand knits so that you can care for the yarn and make sure that you avoid felting, color release, etc. So go back and check those out for refreshers. Quickly, I wanted to talk to you guys about the structure of wool. Picture a strand of hair. It's like a big long bar, right? This is our hair or animal hair, but we're specifically gonna be talking about sheep's wool today, although the principles of it relate to a lot of different animals' wools, and um, some of the principles even relate to your hair, believe it or not, like the fact that both human hair and animal hair have scales on the outside. So the outside layer of hair, there's three layers to hair, and the outside layer is a cuticle. The cuticle is the thing that you notice when your hair is kind of damaged and ruffled and it needs a haircut and it gets those split ends, that's the cuticle that's like splitting and looking all terrible. Um, the cuticle is also what makes your hair kind of frizz up when it's um, an easily ruffled up cuticle. And um, when it's smoothed down and looks all smooth and shiny, that's when your cuticle is tighter and closed down. So animals cuticle has these overlapping scales, just like humans. They lay on top of each other, almost like shingles on a roof. And when they are all laying down the same direction, they look nice and smooth like yarn. When you ruffle those up, they stand up, and then if you subject them to heat and agitation, they get enmeshed and tangled, and then they become a solid wall. Instead of being individual strands, they now all melt into each other. They don't literally melt, but it looks like the stitches melt into each other, and instead of having nice, even little stitches where you can count your, oh, I have five stitches to the inch here, they all mesh in together, which tends to draw in the fabric to shrink it. So you have smaller, more durable, pushed in together, and you can't ever get it apart and you can't ever get it to grow bigger. So there's no blocking once you felt something. It's, I mean, you can like kind of reshape it a little bit, but you can't ever stretch it out like you would stretch out lace. You don't ever want to block your lace. I mean, felt your lace. <laughs> you do want to block your lace. Oh my God, please block your lace. Okay, so now that we know a little bit about what felting is and we know that you need heat plus agitation. The other thing, little extra tip, is it's not just heat that creates it. What actually creates felting is the rapid temperature change. So if you take something and you wash it in really like kind of lukewarm to warmish water, not even hot water, just warm water, and then you immediately dunk it into cold water to rinse it, you're going to create at least a little bit of mild of stress, if not some mild felting on that object. And if you do it enough with enough agitation, even just that temperature change without any heat, just warm to cold, will create some felting. And you could actually lose the definition and possibly the size of your project. Now, if you really want to intentionally felt it, you are gonna to wanna to use hot water. So the first thing you need to know is you need hot water plus agitation. What is agitation? It's when you rub, thing, rub things together and it roughs up those scales and that's how they get tangled or enmeshed. Kind of like when you roll around in bed on Saturday morning because you don't want to get out yet and then you get out of bed and your hair in the back is all like enmeshed together. Except with felting, you can't brush out the tangles and get it back to the way it was before like you can with your hair. So what's the next thing you need to know? What kind of fibers can you do it on? Very first thing you need to know is no superwash fibers ever, period. They're out which means that all of the yarns that I currently sell in my shop are not a good option for felting. Now, 
You can felt with the wool rovings that I have as long as they are not superwash, and you can felt with non-superwash yarns. I just currently do not keep any in my shop because they haven't sold as well for me in the past and they're just they're not as fun for me to dye. But if you would like me to dye some, leave me a comment below. I am collecting um, opinions on whether or not we should add non-superwash wools in the future to the potion yarns output, so let me know if that's something you'd be interested in. However, there are lots of great places you can find yarn online that is 100% wool or a large percentage of wool. You do not ever want to go below 70% wool in the fiber content. So if you have something that's like 50% wool and 50% like rayon or something, it's probably not going to felt. You really want to make sure that you have 70 or more percent non-superwash wool in your blend. I prefer to use 100% wool just to be on the safe side and usually it's pretty economical, affordable, easy to find, etc. Especially online or at local yard stores. It can be a little harder in the big chain craft stores because they tend to stock more man-made fibers like acrylic, but you can find it there sometimes. However, generally your color choices are rather limited, so I prefer to shop online. I will leave a link below to knitpicks.com, which is where I purchased the yarn for the project that I'm going to show you today. It is also one of my favorite places to get felting wool because they have a lot of non-superwash yarns in a lot of different colors, and they have free shipping on orders over $50 and good customer service, so I just really like to work with their yarns for an affordable option. Okay, so now we know you need heat and agitation, you need non-superwash wool, preferably 100%, but no less than 70%, and you want to avoid man-made fibers like acrylic and nylon because those will not felt. Even a little tiny bit like 10% nylon or acrylic in your blend is going to be too much to get it to felt, so you want to just avoid those man-made fibers altogether. Okay, so what's the next thing you need to know? The other thing you need to know is that you want to be careful to separate your uh, pieces if you have more than one piece. Um, this is not a huge deal. This is more of like a cautionary, you might want to do it. So I guess you can think of this as optional. Um, I'm going to be felting slippers today. That's what we're working on. So I have two big pieces. They don't have any long skinny little pieces or any strings. I wove in the ends and everything. So these will probably be okay in just one um load together, but I have done a bag before. I did a little purse that was like this um, kind of like ovally shape, and then you separately knit all these little tiny leaves, and you left long tails to sew them onto the bag later. You felted them separately and then sewed them to the bag because you sewed them in different strategic spots after it was felted. And I was not smart and I put them all in the load together and didn't separate them out. And then those little tiny leaves with the strings attached, the strings got enmeshed into like the handle of the bag. And so I wasn't able to sew them to where I wanted them and I ended up having to re-knit new leaves and sew them over um, sections that I wanted done and do them kind of separately. So if you have smaller pieces or long skinny pieces or ends that aren't woven in, you will probably want to separate things unless you are fine with them in meshing together. But something that's big like this is probably going to be okay. Again, this is kind of an optional thing. If you're worried at all about it, if it makes you nervous to have even two large slippers in the same bag and load together, separate them out. But you don't have to do that. Okay, so what are we going to be doing today? Today we're going to be felting some slippers. This is going to come out after Christmas, so I can tell you that these are going to be a gift. He does not have gargantuan feet, even though everyone in his family is quite tall. Um, he does have pretty big feet, but they're not this big. <laughs> he wears about a size 11 shoe. And so um, in order to make a slipper that fits him, I have to knit it several sizes larger than his actual foot because it's going to shrink in the wash. And that's another thing you need to know about felting is you always want to go bigger. If you want a purse that is this size, you are probably going to need to make it this size so that it will shrink down to this size. So I have followed a pattern. I will put a link to the exact pattern I used below. You can purchase it on Ravelry. I cannot give you any details about how to knit the construction of this since it is a for-purchase pattern. You'll just have to go buy it, but I can heartily recommend this pattern. It is written for men's sizes, so if you want women's sizes, you can still get the pattern and then just adjust the sizing accordingly, um, but it is specifically written for men's sizes. There are some other patterns on Ravelry, though, specifically written for women's or kids' sizes, so you might want to check those out. And the smaller men's sizes will fit a lot of women's um, feet. I just have really, really tiny feet, so none of the sizes in the pattern will fit me. I would have to rejigger numbers to get it to fit me, which I'm thinking about doing if these turn out okay. All right, so we have knit the, the slipper much larger than we meant it to be. We've woven in our ends. 
Now I'm going to put these two slippers into a, I'm going to use a mesh lingerie bag because um, I have one that works well. It's got a zipper on it so I can keep it closed. That way they're not getting entangled in anything, but it still lets all the water in. I've also heard you can use a zippered pillowcase. I don't know um, how great that works for some things. And I'll be honest with you, the first couple things that I felted were bags. They didn't need to fit necessarily like slippers, but I did not put them in a pillowcase or a bag. I just threw them in the washing machine with a towel and it was fine. So it is optional. You can just throw them in. But if you are at all worried about it or if you have a, a zippered pillowcase or you can just like tie the end of the pillowcase if it's a small project like slippers or I'm going to use my mesh lingerie bag, then um, I think that will help it just be a little bit better. You just want to make sure that it's not completely um, waterproof or tight. You want to make sure that the water can still get in. And um, we're going to put this in my top loading washing machine. You can use a front loader as well. It doesn't really matter. You just might have to adjust um, soap and water levels and things. And timing. I've also heard from people that have front loaders that um, you may need to adjust timing up or down. Um, and that's kind of just an individual washing machine thing. But we're going to put this in my top loading washing machine, in my mesh lingerie bag, and then I'm going to add an old towel. I prefer an old towel because this is going to be on a harsh cycle. We're going to use hot water, no cold. And we're going to use a lot of agitation. So there's going to be a lot of moving around, etc. I do want to take this out before the spin cycle starts, though, um, because we don't want all that water to get out. Um, so I'm going to put this in with just a tiny little bit of detergent. Not a lot. You don't want very much soap. You just want a teeny tiny bit to help it like suds and get some agitation in there. But you don't want much. And then hot water, lots of agitation. And then the key to this is checking frequently. Most patterns will give you a lot of specific recommendations on how much felting they did to get the sample to look the way they did. This pattern does, so if you purchase this exact moccasin pattern on Ravelry with that link below, it will give you a lot of information on specifically how much time you should use, how often you should check it, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really important that you have a ruler or tape measure with you and know the size that you are trying to get if it's something that needs to fit or if you care about the finished outcome. My first felting project was a bag and I didn't really care if it was a purse or a tote bag. So I knit this really, really large bag. It looked humongous and ridiculous and then it went in the washing machine. And the first time I brought it out, it was still kind of loose and sloppy. So I threw it back in for a little bit longer and then it came out. And when it was done, it was smaller than the pattern specifications and smaller than my original approach but it was still a good size purse it was just a small purse and I thought that's fine I don't care so I didn't worry too much about measuring it I just went until it looked slash felt right but if it's something that you want to fit like slippers especially if it's a gift you absolutely want to make sure that you are measuring and taking it out frequently here's the key with felting you can never stretch it back up to bigger once it has shrunk down but you can always keep refelting to shrink it further. So if something comes out too small, you're screwed. If it comes out too big, you have options. So with that in mind, always, always overcheck. Literally, if that means you throw it in for set a timer for one minute and stand there watching it nervously and then pull it out, throw it in for another minute, that's fine. And if you're on a deadline and it's a gift, you might want to do that to make sure that you don't go too far. Okay, so I have felted my slippers and I wanted to show you guys the result. I actually, the ones that I showed earlier um, were basically the same as the ones that I'm gonna show you now, just a different color. I was showing you the blue ones before they were felted and I actually had to wrap those ones up and give them as a Christmas gift before I was able to finish shooting this video. But I did two pairs at the same time, so I also did these brown ones, which are also gonna be a gift for somebody and so I'm not gonna tell you who they're for, but you can see these uh, really nice wool slippers all finished and felted. These ones are slightly bigger than the ones I showed you before. Those other ones fit about a size 11 or 12 shoe. Um, this one is probably gonna fit closer to like a 14, 15, um, maybe a 13 to a 15 size foot for a man, man excuse me. Um, and so this is how large, it's still quite large you can see, but it was significantly bigger um, even a little bit bigger than the one I showed you earlier before felting. Now this little uh, flap at the back is part of the moccasin pattern, so I will be um, sewing this down so that it's flat against the back and you have a nice little moccasin. Um, so the main thing is if you look up close, you can see that you can kind of see the garter stitch that was on the bottom, but they've really been, the stitches have really been obscured. And if you look on the top here on the stockinette portion, you can really see 
that the stitches just all blur together. You can't make out individual stitches. It's like a thick pad of fabric. Um, and that is from the heat and agitation that we had in the washing machine. Here's the rub. The pattern that I used knits it extra large. So if you're using the, the link below that has the pattern that I use that you can purchase on Ravelry, it's going to make your slipper significantly larger than it's going to come out. Not all felted projects are going to be that much bigger. Some of them will just be a little bit bigger and you'll felt them down just a little bit until the stitch is obscure, but not super shrink. These ones I had to shrink extra in order to get them even close. So it was really important that I had my measuring tape handy and I was constantly measuring them and constantly checking them because it did take them a lot longer to felt than some of my other projects I've worked on and it took them longer to felt enough down. These are super felted. So the goal is you're making a moccasin slipper so that it's really, really thick and sturdy and it's going to last a lot longer and it's not going to rub through so that you can walk around on them for a long time before they start to show any signs of wear. Some of the bags and things that I felted in the past have not needed to go through as long of a felting process in order to get where they needed to be just because they're little accessories and they're not going to be walked on and be exerted or, or having so much pressure exerted upon them. So check your pattern, make sure that you know what you're doing. If you're making up your own and you're just playing around, keep in mind, are you trying to get something that's extra thick and sturdy? Because if so, you're gonna wanna make it several times larger and shrink it down a lot more and it'll take longer to felt. Or if you're just doing something lightly felted, you don't need to make it quite as big and you can just shrink it a little bit and felt it a little bit to get your desired result. But always consider testing your swatch first and that will give you a much better idea of what the finished fabric is going to look like and whether or not you need to make it bigger, smaller, felt it more or less, etc. So from these ones, um, the pattern gives you quite a few instructions on how to felt if you've never done it before, but I still recommend um, this video and um, looking up some other suggestions for felting online because I, f I felt like she did not give quite as much. Maybe her washing machine just got, went a lot faster or something, but I was not prepared for how long it took me to felt these. Honestly, two pairs of large men's slippers, it took me like three hours in the washing machine. I had to keep restarting the load. And she does give you really good instructions about making sure you don't let it go all the way through the spin cycle because you can get creases in there that don't come out and stuff like that. And so I really appreciated that she had a lot of that extra info. So like on my washing machine, I would set it and I would let it fill up and go through like the agitation process. And um, when it got to like the rinsing and spinning out process, I would just stop the washing machine and restart the cycle to keep it going. Um, sometimes I'd let some of the water out and then restart start it but I wanted to make sure that it had plenty of agitation and a long time in that hot hot water and I used the very hottest setting on my washing machine and um, a little bit of soap and then a lot of agitation. I did put it in with a couple of old towels as well and I put both of my slippers in the lingerie bag that's a mesh lingerie bag so that the water could get in and everything and it still took a really long time to felt it more than I've ever taken on a felted project before but that's why it's important to test your swatch because it can really vary and if you're on a time schedule like I was for Christmas gifts, you really need to try and build in a little extra time because sometimes you will have it go a lot longer. Now, if you're using a front loader machine, that may um, change your time as well. So again, keep in mind that you want to uh, adjust your timing. And then that's another good reason to test your swatch because you'll need to know what kind of time frame you're looking at based on what kind of machine you have. So I think they turned out pretty good. I'm not gonna lie. these. The, the blue ones turned out even better than these ones. These ones were a little bit rougher. And I feel like, I feel like this was a good starter, but I feel like I'm eager to try again and try another pair. I actually have another pattern in a pattern book that I'm thinking about making a women's size slipper for myself next time that you also felt, but it's a little bit different pattern. But I'm, I enjoyed the finished result, but the actual felting took a lot longer than I was expecting. And so it was a little bit more stressful for me. And I'm just really eager to try again and see if I can improve my skills because there were a couple points where I felt like this wasn't quite as well shaped as I wanted. So one thing I wanted to mention also is that when you are making a wearable object, it's even more important than when you're making a bag or a home accessory or something for you to shape it. Now, whatever you're making, you're probably going to need to shape it while it's still hot and wet, but you are going to want to shape a slipper or something that you need to wear or fit to a certain size even more. 
Again, you'll need your tape measure. Make sure that you're checking it to make sure it's felted down enough. And then like for my slippers, when I got them out, they were really wet and I stuffed old um, towels or you could put newspaper or something in there. I stuffed some old towels in there so that the toe was nice and rounded. And um, I stuffed them in and I had to like shape up the sides because they were like flat and like this all funky and weird after they came out of the washing machine. So I had to like shape up the sides and stuff them and then leave them to dry. And it took a couple days for these things to dry out because they were so thick and they were just very, very full of water. And um, yeah, it took, it took a little bit of time, but the result is really good. And um, the recipients of the gifts uh, that I gave, I've already given the blue ones. These ones are gonna go to someone else later but the blue ones that I did, um, the recipient really enjoyed and uh, said that they felt very, very comfy and very good. So yeah, I'm excited. I think I have a new, a new skill. I've never made felted slippers before. This was my first time, but I've always wanted to because I've heard a lot of people talk about it and I feel like it's, it's sort of like knitting your first pair of socks. It's kind of like a rite of passage to felt a pair of slippers at least once. It's one of those things that like everybody has to try at least once, right? And I was like, I can't believe I've been knitting this long and I've still, like I've even tried a couple other felted projects, but um, I'd never done slippers. And honestly, I haven't done a lot of felting. And now that I've done it, I'm kind of eager to try a little bit more and just see if I can improve my technique a little bit more and get better at it. Cause it is kind of like magic. You make one thing and you put it in the washing machine and just a little hot water and some agitation and some time, sometimes a lot of time. <laughs> and when you're done, it's pretty cool. So I'm excited to try it out and see what I can do. Please leave me a comment below and let me know uh, if you've tried felting anything, what you felted, what your um, feelings are about it. If Even if you've never tried felting anything, let me know that too and tell me if you haven't felted anything, why not? Is it because it scares you? Is it just because you don't like the look of felted things? Some people just don't like how knitted felted items look or feel. That's totally okay. Um, but let me know what is standing in your way of trying it. And of course, like I said, if you have done it, please let me know what you felted and, and what your experiences were. If you have a great felted project that you think I should try out, leave me that uh, pattern name below as well and I will look it up and see what I can do. But I hope you guys go forth and enjoy your felting adventures. Hopefully this will give you the courage to tackle that skill if you haven't yet, or the um, inspiration to pull it out, dust it off and try it again if it's something you've done but haven't done recently. Um, and I would love to see your felted creations, so don't forget to tag me on Instagram or Facebook so I can see what you have done recently. I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. It is now time to cast off. Love you.